In his new book, An Inconvenient Minority, The Attack on Asian American Excellence and the Fight for Meritocracy, Kenny Shu examines, quote, affirmative action, the false narrative of American meritocracy, and America's unease about a minority, Asian Americans, potentially upending them. Now, joining us today to discuss is author and president of Color Us United, Kenny Shu. Kenny, welcome. Thanks so much for joining the show. Uh, thank you so much, Emily and Ryan, for having me. So your subtitle says a lot about the thesis of the book, but if you could just sort of walk us through the argument that you make in the book, that would be fantastic. So we have a narrative right now that posits that white people are at the top and black people are at the bottom, but what are they going to do with Asian Americans? Because Asian Americans do not fit this narrative. Um, they are the inconvenient minority. They were historically discriminated against. They faced discrimination. 80% um, of Asian, of Vietnamese Americans arrived in this country without even knowing English. And within one generation, they were able to turn their kids into college graduates at a higher rate than even white Americans. So the American dream is real, you know, and Asian Americans show that critical race theory cannot be true. Uh, and because of this, Harvard University suppresses the story of Asian excellence by discriminating against them in the admissions process because they base their admissions process based off of this critical race theory language where blacks are at the top for racial equity and then Asians are at the bottom. So an inconvenient minority really tells the story about the place of Asian Americans and the fight for meritocracy. How do you how do you parse that given the different experiences? You know, one, you know, one one population, what you know, brought brought in shackles and and uh, in, in, enslaved for several hundred years, and, uh, and then suffered through you know uh, almost a century of of Jim Crow. Uh, followed by you know gains in the in the 60s and 70s, running 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 smack into the deindustrialization of of the economy, the decimation of, of of public sector and union union jobs and manufacturing jobs that had made made up the the bulk of the growth of of black wealth, combined with a with a with a different and disparate um, experience among among Asian Americans. How 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 do you how do you kind of uh, uh, separate out those two things and come to a, a conclusion a, a broad conclusion there? Well, I can give you the most the the most victimy Asian narrative I could possibly give you. I mean so many of these Asian Americans who've come here have literally fled from communism, from the cultural revolution, uh, from Pol Pot, from dictatorships, from identity politics. And, you know, they've come here and they face discrimination in the United States, Chinese exclusion, Japanese internment, and yet they still achieve. Um, you know, the, what we always, t we always try to, um, posit the the worst victim narrative that we could and you just did for black americans um, but i could do the same for asian americans well the same is not well yeah i would say exactly accurate the, well, so it doesn't... Do something of similar magnitude but i but i don't think we should focus on that because i don't think i don't think that we are living in that history today and and the reason why is because you have these Asian Americans whose talents were suppressed, but when meritocracy was able to expand, the Immigration Naturalization Act was able to occur in 1965, legal discrimination was rolled back, not just for black Americans, but for every minority group. Asian achievement was able to skyrocket. You know, Asian success was kept um, you know, and was discriminated against in this country, but we're living in an era where that is no longer really the case. And so you have to really focus on what the cultural values are and how that informs the discourse. And Asian Americans uh, prove that you really can advance and achieve the American dream. So your book deals with the yeah. uh, the consequences of some of this in the form of like the lawsuit against Harvard, as we talked about in the introduction here. Can you talk to us about some of the um, discrimination that sort of counterintuitively ends up affecting Asian Americans today through some of those measures? Talk to us about the lawsuit, the progress of the lawsuit, what you expect to happen, and how that speaks to maybe some of the, the challenges that um, Asian Americans face in terms of discrimination right now. So Harvard University founded critical race theory. Critical race theory came from the law department of Harvard Law School. This is 
undisputed. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw, Derek Bell were the first professors to do that, and then Harvard based their admissions system. Uh, and, it, and it fits right in with Harvard's admission system, which is based on a racial lens. What they do is they racially profile every applicant and they judge every applicant based on their race. A uh, federal department, uh, US Justice Department last year did an investigation of Yale University, which practices the same thing. And they give you at every stage of the admissions process, they give you a plus if you're black or Hispanic, which is a minus if you're white or Asian. And that compounds four times. So they use race at every stage of the admissions process. And so Asian Americans are obviously the lowest downgraded based on Harvard's use of a personality score, where they grade Asians the worst on personality. That's how they justify it. Um, and now we see today that Asian Americans have to score 450 points higher than a black person to have the same chance of admission to Harvard University. And so this, this is an ideology that penalizes success. Kenny, I want you to try to unpack something you said a, you yeah. said a, a moment ago, <clears throat> made kind of a, a, a leap where you said that it, it was in fact the case that previously um, Asian excellence was, was suppressed and, and discriminated against, um, but that's no longer the case uh, or that's less of the uh, case now. But why, why, are, why are you so sure that uh, black excellence is not being suppressed today? What's the, Maybe you're right. What is the evidence for that, though? Like, why, why, why can we stipulate that there was discrimination in the recent past, but that it no longer exists today? Like, what okay, happened so, that, that blew it all up? So, okay, so Heather McDonald did a study in the City Journal, you guys can look it up, um, called The Problem of Blaming Everything on Bias. So in, in this study, which is, you know, has profound evidence, and I, and I read it, I, I'm gonna, about to shed a very unfortunate truth to both of you, and this is not a truth that I relish saying, but the number of black Americans right now who score higher than a 1550 on the SAT for math or higher than a 1500 on the SAT for math is astonishingly low. It's less than, um, it's, it's less than 3000 people um, and per class uh, in, in America today. So it's, it, this, is, this is not good. I mean, this is not good. I mean, put it any way. I don't I don't relish saying that. But the number of Asian Americans who score higher than 1500 on the SAT is comparatively much larger. What, what um, are the, so, Kenny, what, Kenny, what, what are the what are the numbers of, of black students who are in wildly underperforming schools compared to Asian American they students? They are in underperforming schools. They are in underperforming uh, right, schools. So, so, we have to fix the education system. Go right, ahead. So, OK, so wouldn't a disparate education system disproportionately impact those who are disproportionately in underperforming schools? I mean, what, what, like this doesn't seem that complicated. What's the context it, it, of like the systemic um, climate? Right. So they are, in, first of all, black Americans are in underperforming schools. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, but they're in underperforming schools. But why are the schools underperforming? Why are the schools underperforming? Well, the schools have discipline issues. There are poor discipline issues in these schools. Furthermore, there's a lot of grade inflation in these schools. So kids are basically being passed from grade to grade. And I know I've my book is about Asian Americans, but here I am talking about a different community. Uh, so take it with what you will. But students are basic, you know, basically being passed from grade to grade uh, under grade inflation. And as a result, you have in New York City, you know, you have these middle schools that have an 80 percent or 90 percent graduation rate or a 90 percent pass rate between the grades six through eight. But 15 percent of these kids are scored proficiently on the standardized exam that should enable them to pass. So this there's a massive cover. Oh, right. Rate but, going right but Kenny, Go but, Ke but Kenny, yeah. what's I mean, what, what's what's your point? Like, don't what? you think that what I talked about earlier, the, the hollowing out of the black middle class in the in the 80s and 80s and 90s, uh, you know, my coupled with the drug war. Mass like, to, my point is, if we're going to if we're going to address the problem, we have to address the real problem. And the real problem is in these educational communities is not systemic racism done by whites against blacks. It is the failure of the public education system, which is made up of not just whites, but blacks, Latinos and, his, and, and, and Asians as well. And so that's the problem. It's not racism. That's what I'm saying. 
So I, I think Ryan's point, and it gets into sort of chicken or egg, Ryan's point is that that is a, a consequence of systemic right. it, racism. It's not racism. It's just a system that disproportionately disadvantages one particular race. Based on but race. that's not racism. Do you it's have a system like, what, what would you call that? Disproportionately disadvantages? That's what you system. just said. You, you, just, you just said it that is, the public education who's, system who's disproportionately... Fault is whose fault who's is fault that? Is it? The, the people that run the system, obviously. So this is where okay. it becomes... Who runs the system? Who do you think runs the White system? People? I mean, there I think so in many, the, there are so many. This, this is the problem with the systemic racism argument is that the people, the superintendents of a lot of these schools are not white. They're not white. Certainly the city but governments. Point, you have to take accountability for your own communities. That's what you have to do. You have to. You have to. Because that's the only way you can achieve. It's the only way you can succeed in this country if you take accountability for your own community and your own actions. In a, in a country that's 70 percent white, you're, you're going you're gonna to say that the administrators of, a public, of the public school system uh, are, are just uniquely causing this to occur and doesn't have anything to do with the broader system? And, and Kenny, we have to run. So this will be oh, last sure. word to you on this. <laughs> I think that the problems that are going on and in, in the, the black and Hispanic communities, um, I'm, by the way, I'm talking about very specific black and Hispanic communities because I studied the New York City public school system a lot, and it's in my book, An Inconvenient Minority. Um, these problems that are going on in New York City's black and Latino population is a result of a f failures at every level, you cannot just pin it unicausally on white racism. Kenny Shu, the author of An Inconvenient Minority, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you, I appreciate it. We'll be back with more Rising right after this.